Hi. Um, good afternoon. Welcome, everyone, to this uh, webinar on sustainable finance for clean energy in ASEAN. Uh, my name is Cecilia Tam. I'm acting head of the Energy Investment Unit at the International Energy Agency. And on behalf of the IEA and our partners for this event, the ASEAN Centre for Energy and Energy Foundation China, I'm pleased to welcome all of you uh, to this virtual workshop. Um, I'd like to thank our esteemed group of experts for joining our webinar and for sharing your insights and expertise and experience with us today. Um, a special thanks to the ASEAN Center for uh, Energy for helping to convene and organize today's uh, event and for, for sharing your perspectives on the challenges and some of the experiences in ASEAN on financing the uh, region's clean energy transition. A big thanks also to Energy Foundation China for your support and collaboration on this important topic and for facilitating the sharing of experiences from China on financing clean energy transitions. Uh, the IEA recently released an update on its net zero by 2050 emissions roadmap that provides an updated view on how the world can achieve net zero emissions in the energy sector by 2050. It outlines key milestones according to the IEA's net zero scenario, which um, is one possible pathway for the energy sector to achieve net zero CO2 emissions by 2050 and play its part as the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in achieving the 1.5 uh, degree goal. Achieving um, the NZE goal requires mobilizing significant investments in clean energy especially in emerging and developing economies outside of China, where investments have remained stubbornly flat over the last five years, despite sharp increases in advanced economies and in China. Global spending on clean energy is estimated to reach nearly uh, 1.8 trillion by the end of this year, compared to just over a trillion in fossil fuel investments. While this growth in clean energy investments is encouraging, the level um, of investments in fossil fuels today is more than two and a half times what it needs to be in the net zero scenario by 2030. Globally, investments in renewables will need to triple by 2030, and the annual rate of energy efficiency improvements will need to double. Sales of electric vehicles and heat pumps rise sharply as the electrification of end uses facilitates decarbonization of the end use sectors. Annual investments in clean energy need to more than double current levels, reaching four and a half trillion by the early 2030s. In other emerging and developing economies outside of China, clean energy investments will need to rise fivefold by 2030 and sevenfold by 2035. This will require unlocking larger amounts of private capital in emerging and developing economies to finance this transition. It will also require scaling up domestic and international sources of finance and enhance collaboration to share country experiences and lessons learned in mobilizing all sources of capital. Our webinar today provides a platform for countries to share their experience in scaling up finance for investments in clean energy. And we will have presentations from ACE and IEA to help set the scene for, current, for the current situation in ASEAN and on the use of sustainable finance instruments globally and in Asia. This will be followed by a session focused on government's perspectives on some of the major challenges they have faced um, and recent developments. The second session will look at country experiences with green, social, sustainable, and sustainably linked bonds for financing the clean energy transition. The event today is aimed at helping to build capacity in the region on the use of sustainable debt instruments to fund clean energy projects. We will be recording today's webinar and plan to make this available on our website for those who are not able to join us today. With the permission of speakers, we will also make available the, any presentations that are shared. It is my pleasure now to introduce our first presenter, uh, Ms. Rika Safrina, Senior Analyst at ACE, who will provide us an overview of financing the clean energy transition in ASEAN. Rika, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Cecil. Uh, good afternoon from Jakarta. My name is Rika Safrina from the ASEAN Center for Energy. It is a great honor for me to provide you with the general sense rating of financing ASEAN clean energy transition. 
ASEAN is uh, one of the most uh, dynamic regions in the world with the regional energy demand is expected to triple that of 2020 levels by 2050. Meeting this demand growth requires power capacity expansion and investment as seen in this graph. Based on the power development plan of 10 ASEAN member states, uh, around 60% of newly installed capacity between 2021 and 2025 only would come from renewables. In addition, under the ATS scenario or national policy scenario of the seven asset energy outlook, in 2050, about 787 gigawatt of power plant capacity is needed to supply electricity demand. That was based on the stated national policies of 10 ASEAN member states. On average, the renewable energy investment accounts for about 59% uh, in the national policy scenario and 77% in regional target scenario of the total investment required for the power sector. This shows uh, a lot of potential in clean energy investment in Southeast Asia. However, it is found that the current financial sources of clean energy investment in ASEAN is dominated primarily by limited public finance. The high risk and low return of investment has made uh, ASEAN capital banks uh, a little bit reluctant to finance clean energy projects. The investment in electricity transmission networks should be prioritized due to their uh, multiplier effect in meeting long-term energy security and sustainability in ASEAN. Um, in addition, innovations are required to scale up the availability of financial sources uh, as well as budget allocation and strong collaboration with the private sector and international donors. Uh, with this background, it is uh, deep necessary to address the importance of attracting energy investments and sustainable financing for ASEAN. It is also important to identify what kind of key priority areas in building up regional capabilities on energy investments and financing and write them in some kind of roadmap. Uh, this roadmap is expected to provide uh, insightful guidelines for ASEAN regulators and policymakers to design and make better decisions regarding investment policy in the energy sector. As mandated in the APAI Phase 2, uh, ASEAN Plan of Action for Energy Cooperation, uh, the regional blueprint, uh, ASEAN should reach 23% RE share in total primary energy supply and 35% RE share in install power capacity. Uh, and then under the APG program area or ASEAN Power Grid, there is one action plan uh, to uh, about financial investment in the power grid. And also there is a, uh, a guideline in renewable uh, regional energy policy and planning program area or REPP uh, to develop a roadmap until 2025 to enhance capabilities in enabling regulatory environments to attract investment in energy and infrastructure, uh, energy infrastructure and technologies. So we are uh, trying to develop this roadmap and um, by um, by summarizing each IMS uh, targets in terms of clean energy and then their, um, uh, their uh, development or status so far, uh, including the RD share and electrification rate, as well as their uh, financing program available in their own country. Uh, this becomes the basis of uh, the roadmap development. So as you can see here, these are uh, several of uh, uh, clean energy financing programs in each country, but uh, there are more uh, of this. This is the selected one. So yeah, as each ASEAN member state is progressing at a different rate with respect to their clean energy initiatives and investment. So this uh, roadmap will take into consideration the differences and how they can be optimized towards achieving the targets for ASEAN. Therefore, capacity building programs for each country will focus on topics that are most concerned to the countries according, according to this classification. So after analyzing the current state and initiatives of each ASEAN member state, the following areas of capacity building have been determined. The first one is engagement with financial providers on financing terms, because we believe that in some ASEAN member states, uh, issues are faced concerning the financing terms and conditions that do not clearly include coverage of unexpected consequences from the clean energy projects funding or loans. So this is a very basic training to understand all financial terms, and this is very crucial. The second one is the capacity building, uh, how to attract more international investment or funding with limited local financial resources and the 
fast investment or funding required to achieve the clean energy targets. So ASEAN member states must uh, actively uh, seek funding from external sources. Almost all ASEAN member states have stated uh, the uh, conditional and unconditional terms in their uh, nationally determined contribution or NDCs document where they can reach higher target if there are external supports. Uh, some ASEAN member states are already successful in this regard, such as Indonesia and Vietnam, and uh, which recently signed uh, GETP to phase out coal. Uh, and then also there are opportunities from uh, other um, uh, other organization, international organizations, such as the World Bank um, for specific develop, uh, developing countries. Uh, the next one is how to um, finance nature or uh, emerging and major technologies in the power sector. Energy systems and technologies demand rapid, urgent, and ongoing reform. Expansion and advancement of clean energy technologies are needed to meet uh, uh, the targets of uh, net zero or uh, renewable energy target of uh, the ASEAN member states. So ASEAN member states should attract more investment, funding emerging technologies such as CCUS, digitalization in energy sector, hydrogen, ammonia, and also the major one or the existing one such as solar wind uh, or other variable renewable energy. The next one is how to um, mechanisms, um, financing mechanisms for nuclear power. Although it is not renewable, nuclear is a cleaner form of energy, but with higher risk. Uh, that's why uh, I think that was, that's the reason behind some ASEAN members that not considering it in their respective energy mix. Uh, compared to the other ASEAN member states, Indonesia, the Philippines, and Vietnam are considered ready to explore the feasibility of nuclear power program. So the the viability and reliability of nuclear power plant operations are um, um, uh, should be um, should be considered and analyzed very carefully. So various capacity building initiatives could include practical and sustainable management system for a nuclear power plant, personal training, and public private participation. Uh, the next one, the next topic is carbon pricing and trading. Although it is still being debated to some extent, but many countries, particularly the developed ones, have uh, already ventured into carbon pricing as one of the solutions for financing energy transition. ASEAN member states are also inclined to join with some already showing interest, uh, such as in Singapore, Indonesia, and uh, Brunei and Thailand. Uh, the next one is how to finance uh, electric vehicle and biofuel deployment in transport sector, so sustainable transportation. Considering transport is one of the most energy consuming sector in the region following industry, so transformation in the transport sector is also crucial. Um, the next one is clean cooking financing. Um, as of 2020, as an estimated 30% people did not use clean cooking methods in ASEAN. So it means more effort are needed to, uh, by the region to accomplish 100% energy access targets by 2030 as directed by SDG 7. Um, last but not least, microgrid for rural electrification. Most ASEAN member states have reached almost 100% electrification rate, uh, or at least well surpassing uh, 90%. So apart from um, Myanmar and Cambodia, which are still lagging behind but catching up, only a very small portion of other ASEAN member states resident are yet to have access to electricity. Um, we think that um, using microgrid for uh, renewable energy uh, for rural electrification, such as using re uh, renewable energy or small scale uh, liquefied natural gas, uh, could be one of the solution uh, to improve the electrification rate. So moving forward, uh, ASEAN will work with dialogue partners, international organizations, and other stakeholders to implement activities, including workshops, training programs, and seminars uh, until 2025. And I think this webinar is also uh, can be considered as one of these um, capacity building activities uh, to enhance the regional capability in attracting more energy investment and uh, financing in clean energy. So uh, our some policy recommendations, um, uh, this uh, actually this uh, already can be uh, downloaded from our reports, which was also supported by Energy Foundation China. Uh, it, it can be accessed freely from our um, website. So the first uh, recommendation is to enhance capability and capacity to attract clean energy investment by strengthening regional communication and cooperation amongst the ASEAN member states. And then to, um, to create some kind of regional body such as Ener ASEAN Energy Transition Academy or ASEAN Clean Energy Capacity Building Network to develop a syllabus or more or create a training curriculum or materials. And then 
um, to encourage more advanced ASEAN member states to disseminate and share the lesson learned with the other ASEAN member states, and then uh, provide more coordination for enabling regulatory environment. And the second one is to create integrated approach to a green fiscal consolidation. Efforts undertaken to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions can be achieved by a well-designed integrated approach to green fiscal consolidation, such as carbon tax and, or uh, non-tax instruments such as emission trading system uh, and so on. And then implement uh, green or any fiscal consolidation at the regional level can be challenging for ASEAN. For example, um, share do not uh, for example the one that do not share common currency uh, because ASEAN uh, countries do not share common currency therefore a more appropriate implementation will be at the national level with the general guidance or framework in the regional level and last but not least the proposed strategic initiatives could include establishing a proper entity uh, to establish close collaboration uh, between ASEAN member states such as ASEAN green fiscal policy networks so all of these uh, Recommendation are included in this report. You can download them for free through our website or scan these QR codes. Um, yeah, with that, I end my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Back to you, Sophia. Thank you very much, Rika, for this very insightful presentation. Um, we noticed that some of you were raising your hand. So if you would like to ask a question, we invite you to start submitting any questions you may have. Uh, for the, the speakers through the Q&A function uh, in Zoom, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'd now like to invite my colleague, Emma Gordon, Energy Investment Analyst at the IEA, to share with us um, some of insights on the role of sustainable and transition finance instruments in financing the transition. Emma? Thank you, Cecilia. Uh, and thank you, Rika, for that very insightful presentation on, on the ASEAN region. It's um, a great introduction to um, the presentation here. So as mentioned, I'll um, walk through the role of, of sustainable and, and transition finance instruments. But just to start out, I thought it would be helpful to um, look at an overview of the energy investment landscape. And Cecilia gave um, a bit of an introduction to uh, some of these numbers within um, within the initial opening remarks. Um, but a, a good place to start is that energy investment today um, it's a very dynamic picture, but this hasn't always been the case. Um, investment in fossil fuels has uh, been falling um, and clean energy investment um, didn't see a, a sort of commensurate increase uh, even after the Paris Agreement. Um, and then we had the pandemic uh, followed by the global energy crisis. And for fossil fuel investments, that meant an immediate slump followed by uh, um, quite an uncertain recovery although uh, we, we're essentially back to the levels of spending today that we were at uh, just prior to the pandemic. Um, where we have seen a market shift is in clean energy investment, uh, which is now seeing double digit growth uh, at a global level. And looking at these aggregate numbers, the, the message is quite clear that something is shifting at this global level, um, giving a boost to clean energy investment. Um, and this is based primarily on three different factors. Firstly, favorable costs, Secondly, supportive policies, not just um, in, in the climate space, but also related to energy security. Uh, and thirdly, considerations of industrial strategy and employment as countries seek to position themselves uh, in the emerging clean energy economy. So how do we see this spending evolving if we're to meet the sustainable development goals and, and climate goals? From 2026 to 2030, um, average investments in clean energy in emerging market and developing economies, excluding China, um, must rise from around 260 billion US dollars in 2022 to reach nearly 1.4 um, trillion US dollars. This will need to reach over 1.8 trillion on average between 2031 and 2035, which represents a sevenfold increase compared to current levels. Um, I hope you can all still see the slides okay. Um, and while this uh, while this spending happens across um, all clean energy technologies, clean power and grids account for nearly 60% of the spending um, up until uh, 2035. Now, all regions will see significant growth in clean energy investment, although the spending needs within each region do vary, um, as highlighted very clearly within Rika's presentation, even within regions, uh, there can be a lot of uh, difference uh, in terms of country needs. 
And also, as Rika highlighted, unlocking the necessary finance for these activities is a major challenge. And one of the things that we look at within our analysis is different tools that can help access that capital. And one of the trends that we've been tracking for some years now is the growth in sustainable debt issuances, which can act as a tailwind for clean energy investment. Now, here, when we talk about sustainable debt, we're talking about both bonds and loans that uh, are raised on the justification that they are green, social or, um, or sustainable. And within clean energy, debt raising plays a very important role. Clean energy technologies are generally quite capital intensive. So loans or for larger project bonds are often a very important part of uh, the financing um, suite of, of options. And in the market, these sustainable debt issuances can raise debt at a cheaper level than so-called vanilla debt raising. And that occurs because the provider of the loan or the buyer of the bond has the view that environmental and social risks need to be priced in. So within the energy space, there are really uh, three main ways that we can see sustainable debt playing a role. Now, first, it can be issued uh, by energy industry or, or transport companies. Um, and they can use this debt raising to fund new projects or, or internal processes. And these corporate issuances, which you can see here on the slide, again, at a global level, um, account for about 40 percent of the activity that we've seen in the market since 2016. Next up, you can have issuances by financial institutions. Um, again, this can be bonds um, or loans, and oftentimes it's for the purpose of on lending. And this means passing those cost savings on um, to the recipient of, uh, of the loan or debt. Overall, the financial sector makes up a smaller share of issuances at just over 20%. Um, but there is, again, variety between regions. For example, in China, these financial sector issuances account for nearer 40%. Um, and this is because of the nature of the financial system, uh, including the importance of the large policy banks uh, and the dominance of indirect lending practices. Now, the third major way that uh, sustainable debt issuances can be used to support the energy sector are via sovereign, sub-sovereign uh, or supranational issuances. So supranational being issuances at the multilateral uh, organization level. Um, and we've seen the role of sovereign bonds really growing, particularly in Europe, uh, but we're starting to see them um, used more in emerging market and developing economies to fund things like um, public transportation or renewable energy installations. And despite this growth in sustainable debt issuances, there are still some concerns around regional imbalance, including when you compare um, the issuances to clean energy spending. So while only 22% of sustainable debt issuances um, are in China and other emerging market and developing economies, those same countries account for nearly half of clean energy spending. And this then raises the question of how can this type of debt raising be made more useful or, or more widespread uh, within emerging market and developing economies. And looking at a breakdown specifically of, of sustainable debt within EMDEs, first off, we can see the same dramatic growth between 2020 and 2021 when these instruments really took off globally. In that same year, China became the second largest green bond market in the world behind the US, uh, a position it still holds today. Uh, and that was following a series of regulatory changes and the introduction of taxonomies that define green activities that really added policy and regulatory weight behind the market. Outside of China, we've also seen over 10% growth in issuances from ASEAN countries between 2021 and 2022. These are mostly dominated by Singapore and Malaysia, which account for about 30% uh, of total ASEAN issuances to date uh, for, for both, uh, both countries. Where we don't see the same growth trend is in other emerging market and developing economies outside of ASEAN and China. And while there are pockets of activities, for example, in India uh, and Latin America, um, it, it speaks to the fact that this is a very large and diverse group of countries, many of which don't have deep capital markets or access to international capital markets, and therefore struggle to use this type of instrument. Now, breaking down these regional differences, um, it's interesting to look at what themes of debt are being um, are being raised. So green, social, sustainable or sustainability linked. 
And it's important to note that while taxonomies that countries apply, so these are the, the guidelines the country uses to define what is a green or sustainable activity, while these taxonomies can vary, there are global standards from organizations like ICMA, the International Capital Markets Authority, and CBI, the Climate Bonds Initiative, which make these numbers relatively comparable. And what we see across the board is that green bonds and loans uh, are the most popular instruments, ranging from around 77% of activity in China to 52% in both advanced economies and, and ASEAN. Something that's interesting to see is, is the emergence of sustainability-linked bonds, uh, which are here in the light blue uh, on the pie charts you can see um, on the slide. And these are a relatively new instrument. Um, we saw green bonds start to emerge between around 2014 and 2016, whereas SLBs um, really only became popular in, in 2021. And SLBs are, are a very different type of instrument. Um, green, social and sustainable bonds are, are what's known as use of proceeds bonds, uh, which means that debt is raised for a predefined activity, uh, which obviously therefore means there's a lot of monitoring and verification processes that accompany the bond issuance. SLBs, on the other hand, are a lot more flexible because they raise debt to fund activities that support the achievement of a particular target. So often that will be activities that will support emissions reduction, for example. Uh, and that target is um, assigned also a point in time at which it must be achieved. And already, despite the fact that this is a new instrument, we can see that they account for over a quarter of the issuances um, by cumulative, cumulative issuances by dollar value uh, in both ASEAN and uh, advanced economies. And part of the reason for that is um, their potential role in funding transition activities. Now, transition activities in emissions intensive sectors like heavy, um, heavy industry um, pose a particularly unique challenge when it comes to financing because often they won't qualify for pure play green financing options. Um, so it's becoming clear that transition activities really do need their own financing instruments. And there are a couple of different instruments that can be used here. Um, classic loans, of course, um, transition bonds, which are a new type of use of proceeds bond. So they operate similar to, to a green bond, but instead of being assigned to green activities, it's um, activities that are defined as uh, transition, uh, or of course, uh, sustainability linked bonds. And this is a very fast evolving area, but we're already seeing some interesting examples of how regulation can be used to help drive investment uh, into transition activities. For example, last year, uh, the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group uh, produced a transition finance framework, which can serve as the basis uh, for uh, future taxonomies. Uh, the Chinese government has also taken uh, a number of different steps, such as a pilot for um, SLBs uh, within heavy industry. So that included a lot of steel companies, uh, for example, issuing um, SLBs. Uh, they also have um, some sub-regional uh, transition taxonomies that could again serve as the basis uh, for a more national um, and centralized transition finance uh, taxonomy. Japan is also uh, one of the other countries that's really leading the way here. Uh, in 2020, uh, the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry created the basic guidelines on climate transition finance. Uh, and the ministry has also created industry specific decarbonization plans um, for multiple industries, including iron, steel, uh, cement, oil and gas, etc. And this last point is, is very important. When it comes to transition activities, clear science based, ideally centralized transition pathways laid out by industry are an absolutely necessary guide, both for companies themselves and for finance providers. And those pathways really ensure that the target setting by companies is in line with the transition plan and is as ambitious as possible. And already, as highlighted, we're seeing countries and global bodies discussing these draft proposals for taxonomies and transition pathways that can really help drive more capital into these vital transition activities. And on that, I'll leave it there and pass back to the moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emma, for this informative overview of different sustainable and transition finance instruments. Um, I'd like to just mention to our participants that if you have any questions on either of these two excellent presentations, please use the Q&A function in the Zoom, and we will pose these to our speakers together with any questions for uh, coming out of session one. 
I'd now like to hand over the moderation of session one to Dr. Ambiya Abdullah, Senior Research Analyst at uh, the ASEAN Centre for, for Energy. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you so much. Is my voice clear now? Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, let us, uh, okay, let me introduce myself. My name is Ambi Abdullah. I am senior researcher at ASEAN Center for Energy. So I will be the moderator for this session. For the session one is scaling up the finance for the clean energy transi transition. So uh, on this session, we will have two present two present two presentation one is from the philippines and the second one is from indonesia so without further ado i would like to invite uh, mr william quanto assistant director of the planning bureau department of energy philippines mr william are you ready thank you dr okay. thank yeah, thank you can so you much for well? accepting. Yes, yes, we can hear you well. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and providing us your uh, time. So let me uh, briefly introduce Mr. Quinto. Mr. Quinto is a civil engineer by profession, profession passing his uh, license exam in 1988. In 2007, he received a scholarship on energy economics at the Reading University conducted by the Foreign Commonwealth Office of the United Kingdom. With more than 35 years uh, experience in government service, uh, Mr. Quinto is now the Assistant Director of the Energy Policy and Planning Bureau of the Department of Energy, assigned in the formulation updating, monitoring, and evaluating the national and local energy plans policies, program, and project, and also providing a comprehensive assessment of demand scenario and supply option, as well as studying the impact of international commitment on energy policies, economy, and environment. Uh, thank you so much again. So you will have uh, about 10 to 15 minutes uh, for your presentation. So time is here. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ambia. Can we have our slide, please? Okay, good afternoon to everyone. Allow me to express my sincere gratitude to the International Energy Agency, the ASEAN Center for Energy, and the Energy Foundation China for inviting the Philippines to be part of this webinar and speak about the prospects and challenges in financing energy transition in the Philippines. Resonating for the pronouncement made by the Secretary Rafael Pilotilla in the previously concluded 41st ASEAN Ministers on Energy meeting held in August, there is a need to take into careful consideration the cross-pillar initiatives to ensure effective and holistic implementation of programs and activities under the ASEAN umbrella of energy cooperation. I am glad that we are joined by a diverse panel today who will talk about that and advance the discussion on sustainable financing for energy in the ASEAN. Next slide, please. This will be the order of my presentation. Next slide, please. Shown in the slide is the country's total primary energy supply or the energy mix by fuel type. In 2022, the energy supply reached 61.6 million tons of oil equivalent, of which a little over 49% or 30.4 million tons of oil equivalent came from indigenous or domestic sources, and the remaining 51% or 31.1 million tons of oil equivalent was imported fuels. Geothermal energy represents 14.6% of the total primary energy supply when the efficiency factor of 10% is applied. As illustrated, coal continues to make up a big portion of energy supply, accounting for 31% or 19.1 million tons of oil equivalent. 
of the total 12.4% or 7.6 million tons of oil equivalent is indigenous, whilst 18.6% or 11.4 million tons of oil equivalent is imported. Next slide, please. In terms of energy demand, the country's total final energy consumption in 2022 reached 35.9 million tons of oil equivalent, a slight increase from its 2021 level of 35.1 million tons of oil equivalent. Among the major economic sectors, transport is the most energy intensive sector at 34.4% share, followed closely by the residential sector with 28.8%. The aggregate oil demand, including non-energy and fuel, and fuel input to power generation, increased for 17.7 million tons of oil equivalent in 2021 to 18.3 million tons of oil equivalent in 2022. This is attributable to the accumulations in oil consumption in the transport sector and the power plants. Next slide, please. The total on-grid power generation, the generating capacity reached 28,258 megawatt. Coal power plants with 12,420 megawatts or 44% as well as renewable-based power plants with 8,264 megawatts or 29.2% remain a significant part of the country's power generating supply. Dependable capacity, on the other hand, totaled 23,596 megawatts in 2022. Coil supply, more than half or almost 60% of the or 66,430 gigawatts of the total power generation, which is 111,516 gigawatt. This is followed by renewables at 22%, with 24,684 gigawatt, and natural gas at 16%, with 17,884 gigawatt. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. In line with the national target of achieving 35% renewable energy share in the power generation mix by 2030 and 50% by 2040, the DOE is currently updating the Philippine Energy Plan and also formulating the Energy Transition Plan for Cleaner Energy. Shown in the slide is a snapshot of what the updated PEP will look like. The department has, has issued several new policies to streamline and hasten advancement of renewable energy such as energy storage system, offshore wind, and floating solar development, green energy auction program, renewable proposed standards, and net metering, to name a few. The DOE has likewise delivered on its commitment in supporting electric vehicles, alternative fuels, energy virtual one-stop shop or EVOS, National Energy Efficiency Conservation Program, and the Total Electrification and Lifeline Rate Programs. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, thank you. In our transition to a clean energy future, it is envisioned that the Philippine energy sector has all key components achieved. Energy security, sustainable energy, resilient infrastructure, competitive energy sector, smart homes and cities, and empowered consumers. Along this line, the Philippines cannot discount the importance of private sector participation towards the realization of our vision for the Filipino people. Our energy sector is largely in private hands, decentralized, market-driven, and unsubsidized. Total investment under the clean energy scenario, the Philippine Energy Plan, requires 153 billion U.S. dollars. Over the years, various cooperative activities and initiatives in the global energy sector are being geared towards energy transition. Currently, the DOE is taking advantage of the opportunity to implement various programs and projects to maximize foreign assistance such as Green Energy Fund and Energy Transition Fund for consumer protection, use of new emerging 
and more efficient energy technologies and development and utilization of RE sources and other clean energy sources. To keep up with the current trend, the department has been collaborating with various development partners and international organizations, some of which are Energy Transition Council, or the ETC, Energy Transition Partnership, or the ETP, Just Energy Transition, or the JET, and the Energy Transition Mechanism, as well as the Clean Energy Finance and Investment Mobilization, or CEFIN. Please allow me to provide a quick background on these collaborative initiatives. The overall purpose of the ETC is to enable an effective dialogue between countries that require support of their energy transition, implement tailored solutions in a range of areas, including integrated energy planning, green grids, and energy efficiency more rapidly. On the other hand, ETP aims to bring together governments and philanthropies to work with partner countries in the region to accelerate the energy transition by financing technical cooperation activities to support the transition towards modern energy systems that can simultaneously ensure economic growth, energy security, and environmental sustainability. On the JEP, we know that the multi-stakeholder consultation conducted on October 24, 2022. It is aimed to discuss policy options and ways forward to reconcile the need for affordable and reliable power to support the country's development goals while enabling it to meet its nationally determined contributions commitment by way of socially just transition of the country's energy sector. Moving forward with ETM, the Philippines was selected to develop an investment plan for the Accelerating Coal Transition Program of the Climate Investment Fund. The main objective of the ACT program is to tackle key barriers related to governance, people, and infrastructure, address funding gaps, leading to the successful implementation of country-level strategies and associated kickstart projects, build support at the local and region levels, and accelerate the retirement of existing coal assets, coal mines, and coal power plants, together with enabling new economic activities for those impacted by the transition. Lastly, the SEHIM program builds upon the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or EOECD's strong engagement with the Philippines and support the country in unlocking finance and investment flows to achieve the clean energy targets and sustainable finance goals. The program draws on extensive stakeholders' engagement and will provide tailored recommendations through implementation support activities and investor dialogues. These will be complemented by regional peer learning activities. Next slide, please. This ends my presentation. I hope that through this webinar, we can advance our initiatives toward individual and collective aspirations on energy transition in the region. Apologies as I need to rush to another engagement, but I'm more than happy to connect with you outside this meeting should you wish to need more information or a country's energy transition plans and initiatives. Thank you very much for your kind att attention. Mabuhay po tayong lahat. Thank you so much, yeah, Mr. Uh, William. So, yeah, unfortunately, we cannot help you uh, to be present at the Q&A, but we hope your uh, support, uh, maybe if there are any questions related to the PDP, you would be able, if your time allows, would be appreciated if you respond. Thank you so much again for your time. And now let me invite uh, Ms. Andrea Febi Misna from the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resource of Indonesia. Uh, Selamat sore, Bu. <laughs> so, good afternoon, Bu uh, Andrea. So, let me intro briefly introduce about her. So, 
Miss Andrea Febi, Febi Misna. She is currently a director of the various new energy and renewable energy and has professional experience in clean energy for more than uh, 12 years. Previously, she was director of bioenergy at the MEMR from 2018 to 2022. She was also deputy director of investment and cooperation on various new and ren new and renewable energy from 2017 to 2018. Before that, she was a deputy director of the energy conservation program planning from 2015 to 2017. So she graduated from double degree master development planning management infrastructure from ETB and master environmental and infrastructure planning Groningen University, Netherlands. So without further ado, let us invite Ms. Andrea Febi Misna. So Bu Andrea, you will have 10 to 15 minutes for your presentation. So the floor is yours, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you Dr. Ambia for the long, long introduction. Good afternoon and best wishes uh, to all of us. Thank you very much for having me in this event. It is a great honor for me to be here among experts and all related stakeholders on sustainable finance. Uh, we appreciate ASEAN Center for Energy, International Energy Agency, and also Energy Foundation China for organizing this event, where we can exchange knowledge and views on the development and use of sustainable debt instrument to fund clean energy projects in China and other ASEAN economies. We can start with the first uh, slide. Similar to other countries in global, Indonesia also has commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emission as part of our responsibility uh, to climate change. In short term, uh, we have target to achieve 26% of renewable energy contribution in total energy mix. And in medium term, Indonesia also has committed to an enhanced nationally determined contribution with a target to reduce emission from 29%, which is equivalent to 835 million tons of CO2, to, to be 32%, which is equivalent to 915 million tons of CO2 by 2030. The energy sector's uh, contribute, the energy sector's contribution has also increased from uh, 314 million ton of CO2 to 358 million ton of CO2, where the achievement of the actual uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction as of July 2023 have reached 118 million ton of CO2. To meet the emission reduction target of 358 million ton of CO2 in the energy sector, it is imperative to implement emission reduction initiative across various areas, including energy efficiency, renewable energy, clean power plant, low carbon fuel, and also mine reclamation. In terms of renewable energy, from the graph, we can see that the installed capacity of uh, renewable energy power plant tend to increase even quite really slow due to COVID-19 pandemic and also some fossil generation under fast track program in the COD in 2022. The installed capacity of renewable energy in the second semester of 2023 is around 12.7 gigawatt. Next, please. Regarding the renewable energy resources, actually Indonesia has a huge potential in the form of various renewable energy resources up to 3.7 terawatt of abandoned and distributed renewable energy resources are available to be utilized for supplying national energy demand in the future. The potential include hydro, uh, which is spread especially in North Kalimantan, Aceh, West Sumatra, North Sumatra, and also Papua. We also have a huge potential of solar, particularly in, in uh, East uh, Nusa Tenggara, West Kalimantan and Rio, which has uh, higher radi radiation. Wind uh, with the potential more than uh, the speed of wind more than six meters per second, mainly found in East Nusa Tenggara, South Kalimantan, West Java, South Sulawesi, Aceh, and also Papua. We also have uh, potential of ocean energy, geothermal, and also uh, bioenergy. 
Unfortunately, the utilization of renewable energy is only 0.3% of its total potential. The substantial renewable energy potential must be harnessed and optimized to meet the increasing energy demand of the Indonesia population, driven by ongoing economic growth. Next, please. In, in the long-term target, Indonesia also has strong commitment and ambitious goal to achieve net zero emission by 2060 or sooner. In COP26 in Glasgow, we already declare our commitment for net zero emission. Within the energy sector, we aim to reduce greenhouse gas emission by approximately 93% from the business as usual level, which, uh, which was uh, around 1,900 million ton of CO2 down to uh, 129.4 million ton of CO2 by 2016. This reduction will be achieved through a range of strategies, including the massive development of renewable energy, either of grid and on grid, as well as uh, biofuel development. Now we already implemented uh, B35 for diesel blending. And uh, the other strategy is electrification program through massive utilization of electric vehicle, induction cooker, and also agricultural electrification. The third uh, strategy is moratorium of coal fire power plant and early retirement of existing coal fire power plant. And we also would like to encourage the utilization of new energy source such as hydrogen, ammonia, as well as uh, nuclear power plant. And for the sector that cannot, uh, uh, that uh, in the sector that still use the fossil fuel, so we encourage to implement the CCS and CCS. And at the last, we also uh, will implement the energy efficiency program uh, to reduce the emission uh, reduction. Uh, the government also developed transition roadmap to achieve net zero emission by 2060 or sooner, uh, <clears throat> while also supporting the green economy. Uh, this roadmap represents a shared commitment between the government and stakeholders as part of the global community effort to mitigate climate change. In essence, net zero emission can be fit from two perspectives, the supply side and also the demand side. Sorry, the previous slide, please. On the supply side, uh, this involves the extensive uh, development of new renewable energy sources, uh, reducing the use of fossil fuel in power plants through programs like de-dieselization and phasing out of uh, fossil fuel power plant, adapting low emission technology such as carbon capture storage and also advancing smart grid infrastructure, exploring energy storage solution and implementing new energies such as uh, green hydrogen, ammonia, and nuclear. On the demand side, uh, this required promoting uh, the use of electric vehicle, advancing induction cooker, expanding phosphor gas network, uh, utilizing of biofuel, and implementing of energy management. Next slide, please. In the net zero uh, emission roadmap, the projected electricity demand for the year 2060 is estimated to reach uh, 1,900 terawatt hour, with the industrial and transportation sectors being the, being the dominant consumer. This electricity demand will be met by power generator with 96% of the supply coming from renewable energy sources and 4% uh, from new energy uh, resulting in the total capacity of uh, 700 uh, gigawatt. Among the renewable energy source, variable renewable energy account for 77% of the total renewable energy capacity, uh, complemented by energy storage technology like hydroelectric pump storage and also battery energy storage system. Meanwhile, PLM through its green RUPTL has also targeted to add renewable energy power plan to 51.6% or around 20.9 gigawatt until 2030. The roadmap 
established the additional power plant development after 2030 will only come from renewable energy. The capacity of variable and renewable energy in the form of solar power plant will significantly increase starting in 2016, followed by wind power plant in 2037. Since solar and wind farm energy production fluctuates and do not consistently generate energy in the whole day, intermittency issue cannot be avoided. Thus, we plan to improve the infrastructure by developing smart grid for ensuring the reliability of supply. In addition, we also will build new transmission lines or super grid to enhance connectivity and reduce intermittency across the country. Super grid could connect high energy demand areas, but low renewable uh, energy potential with low energy demand areas, but have a lot of potential of renewable energy. The interconnectivity will optimize the utilization of renewable energy source toward net zero emission, creating sustainable energy system throughout Indonesia. And the Supergate will also open up an opportunity to export electricity, especially to ASEAN member countries. To transition to a net zero emission, it is essential to secure significant funding to support this effort, as it often involves costly transition and substantial capital investment. And the substantial, and the substantial investment required for the new renewable energy development to achieve a net zero emission. Uh, sorry. Yeah. To achieve the net zero emission targeted uh, by 2023, the amount that we need is uh, around 1, 000, uh, 1, 1 1.1 trillion US dollar, which is equivalent to an annual investment uh, about 28.5 billion US dollar per annum. This funding will be allocated to the development of generation and also the transmission line. The largest uh, investment need are to development of nuclear, hydro, hydro, solar, and also wind power plant. To achieve net zero emission, Indonesia face challenge in financing, namely Indonesia government face limitation in allocating budget, uh, and also the financial institution Indonesia face a significant uh, challenge due to limited due to their limited experience and knowledge in effectively uh, evaluating renewable energy project. And also the risk uh, that uh, we know from renewable energy is quite high. So uh, this is uh, one of the other challenges uh, in uh, renewable energy investment. Uh, and also the mismatch between the demand uh, for financing and the actual supply of funds for renewable energy projects. And the other challenge is the absence of domestic non-recourse financing option for renewable energy project in Indonesia. And also the uh, financial institution uh, lack of compelling incentive to establish a green portfolio or invest significantly and also uh, the, the last one is uh, the cost of capital renewable energy project can be substantially primarily due to elevated interest rate imposed by them. This high interest rate uh, render renewable energy project less financially attractive and also discouraging investment in this sector. So the, to overcome the financial concern, exploring alternative financing, uh, exploring alternative financing mechanism, attracting investment and forging partnership with uh, international stakeholders become important to expedite the progress achieved net zero emission. Next please. Uh, the Indonesia government actively uh, promote uh, renewable energy development by offering fiscal incentive uh, fiscal and non-fiscal incentive. So, uh, and uh, we also, um, uh, the incentive have reduced the tax burden on company investing in uh, renewable energy, making investment more attractive and profitable. 
Uh, and in addition, non-fiscal incentives such as uh, support for biofuel through uh, the palm oil, uh, palm oil Fund Management Agency, it also can enhance the competitiveness of renewable energy products and support sustainable development. All of these incentives promote the growth of uh, renewable energy and contribute positively to the environment and net zero emission goal. Uh, ensuring the potential investor are well informed about the incentive and can easily navigate the application process is crucial to promote uh, investment uh, renewable energy project. Uh, next, please. Next, please. And Indonesia government specifically offers several facility climate change financing. Climate change finance involves funding low carbon and climate resilient development initiative, uh, which is climate change finance consists of various source of funding. One of, of them is public financing, including central and local government budget, as well as uh, fiscal incentive. In addition, the public financing, there are blended finance, uh, financing, national non-public uh, financing, international public financing, and also international non-public uh, financing. And for blended financing include the SDGs Indonesia One. It is an integrated platform to support SDGs related uh, project aimed at raising funds from investor, donors, and also beneficiary. Indonesia Climate Change Trust Fund uh, facilitate uh, the acquisition of fund from donor, namely ADV, Europe Investment Bank, World Bank, and Euro European Investment Bank. It can be grant or also loan. And the, for the national non-public financing, <clears throat> is a source of development funding that come from parties outside the government, including the private sector, the community, and national institution. Uh, national non-public uh, um, non financing include the sustainable finance by banking and other financial services, public private public private partnership, public uh, direct investment, and also uh, financing from philanthropy. And for the international public financing, uh, it's uh, among other is uh, Green Climate Fund, Global Environmental, uh, Global Environment uh, Facility, multilateral, multilateral Development Bank, and also development agency from other countries such as GCM, uh, AFD, and also others. And for the international and public financing can take the form of financing by international bank, such as uh, Standard Charter Bank, which is financing uh, the Chirata Floating Solar PV project. Next, please. Okay, this is, I think, the, my, the, the last of my, my slide. Uh, the Indonesia government, along with foreign cooperation partner, get support from JP and also uh, ASEAN uh, Zero Emission Community for successful of energy transition. Uh, for the JP Just Energy Transition Partnership, Indonesia and the and the developed countries uh, make up the international partner group, which is led uh, by the United States and Japan declare a joint commitment to establish the Just Energy Transition Partnership at the 2022 Group of 20, J20 Summit in Bali. The partnership aims to support the ambitious and equitably and uh, equitable energy transition in Indonesia's electricity sector to keep global temperature rise below 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius. To JP, Indonesia has committed to reducing its peak greenhouse gas emission to 2,090 metric ton of carbon dioxide by 2030, and also accelerating the share of new and renewable energy mix out of its overall energy mix to 34% by 2030, and achieving net zero emission uh, by 2050. To support Indonesia in achieving this target, IPG member have reached uh, 20 billion US dollar in funding from both the public and private sector to finance Indonesia energy transition project over the next three to five years. 
Five investment focus uh, have been identified to accelerate the energy transition, namely transmission line and grid deployment, early coal fire power plant retirement, best of renewable energy deploy deployment uh, acceleration, and renewable uh, value chain enhancement. Currently, uh, the JFP Secretariat is finalizing is finalizing the comprehensive investment and policy plan that has been uh, prepared. And for the ASEC, uh, actually this is the initiative for the Office of the Prime Minister of Japan. Uh, this initiative includes Japan desire to develop cooperation with strategic partner countries to leverage Japanese technologies, technical capability and know-how, especially related to the utilization of hydrogen and ammonia resource to support ASEAN countries in their uh, transition toward the carbonization uh, zero uh, emission in Asia. And Japan plan to raise around 500 million US dollar in funding to, to assist Indonesia in adapting renewable energy and expanding its grid network under the public private decarbonization initiative. Okay, I think this is my last slide. Thank you very much. I pass back to Dr. Ambia. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Andrea, for your very detailed presentation. Now, uh, let's move to the Q&A with the, uh, all the presenters. So now I would like to also invite uh, Ms. Rika Safrina, the presenter from the ACE, and also Ms. Emma from the IEA to join the Q&A session. And uh, we have about uh, seven minutes, unfortunately. So let me start the Q&A session with the, each of the presenter here. Let me start with the question to Miss Emma from the IEA. So uh, we would like to know like, what are the challenges of attracting finance to transition activities as opposed to the clean energy? Sure, thank you for the question. Um, so I'll, I'll keep it very brief, just uh, conscious of the time sensitivities. As highlighted in the presentation, one of the difficulties with transition activities is that um, they often don't qualify for green instruments. Um, and some of the definitions are either more vague or we don't have the same sort of regulatory developments around transition finance as we do um, green finance. So some of the things that really help spur the growth in sustainable debt issuances was the issuance of things like green taxonomies, um, of which there has been um, a lot of global cooperation to define what activities count as green. When it comes to transition, that is um, much more industry and country specific. So understanding the decarbonisation pathway for particular industries in the country context is absolutely vital to ensure that transition finance isn't um, at risk of greenwashing and that it really is being used to support activities that are as ambitious and as tied to decarbonisation as possible. So it means we're still in this phase of sort of defining those activities and creating a regulatory environment that can then drive um, the necessary investment, including private investment, uh, into those transition activities. Oh, I think you're I'm on. Sorry, I'm with it. Yeah. Thank you so much for your response. I think the, the beginning phase of the introduction of the just energy transition investment would be very crucial because the typical or characteristic of the just energy transition is slightly different with the clean energy investment. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. So let me move to the uh, my colleague, uh, Ms. Rika Safrina. So we would like to you think that makes the ASEAN region will switch to attract the private sector investment in clean energy transition, considering uh, the characteristic of the energy demand growth of the region will be uh, uh, significant up to 2050. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for the question, um, um, yeah. So yeah, as, mentioned, as I mentioned also in the presentation, ASEAN has rapid economic growth and energy demand. Uh, 
currently not all ASEAN countries have yet achieved 100% electrification rate and clean cooking access. It means that the region is still um, developing the necessary infrastructure and technologies to cover the needed energy demand. So these new developments uh, should be should ensure that it is not only affordable, secure, reliable, but also sustainable. So balancing energy trilemma will always be the key challenges of the region and main agenda of the ASEAN policymakers. It, it cannot be achievable without uh, sufficient investment and finance. Uh, de depending only on the fiscal public finance is not enough. Uh, that is why um, several ASEAN countries have also uh, stated their conditional targets in their NDCs, showing that they need external supports to achieve more ambitious uh, net zero emissions targets. Therefore, uh, private sector investment has uh, a lot of potential in the Asian region and um, like the ASEAN countries should create a more attractive regulatory and enabling regulatory framework to attract more private investment. Thank you so much for uh, explaining in very clear and detailed response for the question. Yeah, uh, I totally agree with your response that uh, energy demand growth in the region would require a huge uh, private investment to be involved in, in, in financing the energy transition in the region. Yeah, in addition to the limited uh, availability of the public finance in, in, the, in the region. Thank you so much, Ms. Rika Safrina. So now let me move to uh, Ibu Andrea, Ms. Ibu Andrea. So it's a very interesting presentation uh, about uh, uh, energy, how's the energy finance and also the energy uh, decarbonization pathway in, in Indonesia. So we would like to know like uh, when we look on the Indonesia, uh, Indonesia is one of the countries with many options for clean energy funding. For example, let's say like in a EEGF and uh, SMI and also CTF we have. Uh, I wonder how do these funds overall contribute to boost the clean energy share in Indonesia? And more importantly, how are they coordinated uh, under the, the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resource of Indonesia? Thank you. Uh, I think you are muted, Bu. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you for the, the question. Um, yeah, uh, we have uh, some uh, climate uh, finance uh, from Indonesia, for example, such as the, uh, we have the Sarana Multi Infrastructure, uh, which is uh, this is uh, can be a, a country platform in several funding mechanisms, such as SDG Indonesia One, also Energy Transition Mechanism, and as well uh, JFP. Uh, which is uh, they play a role in uh, include the coordinating with the stakeholder, conducting a comprehensive study related to fiscal support, formulating the concept of integrating fiscal support, and also the risking facility from uh, the other regulated uh, source, and taking necessary steps for the implementation of the country platform, actually. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea, for your response. So now let me move uh, again to my colleague, Ms. Rika Safina. So uh, you explain about how the potential or contribution of the private uh, investment in, in, in financing the energy transition in the region. So I would like to know how important are uh, regional platforms in attracting further investment to energy transition in the region? Okay, um, thank you for thank you for the question, um, Yeah, So uh, we have the ASEAN Plan of Action for Energy Cooperation or APAI, which serves as a blueprint and regional platform in ASEAN energy sector. Um, currently, uh, the, the current cycle is uh, 2021 until 2025 with the theme of enhancing energy connectivity and market integration in ASEAN to achieve energy security, accessibility, affordability, and sustainability for all, with the sub-theme accelerating energy transition and strengthening energy resilience through greater innovation and cooperation. So uh, in this APAI uh, blueprint, there are seven program areas, 
uh, including ASEAN Power Grid, um, Trans ASEAN Gas Pipeline, uh, Coal and Clean Coal Technology, uh, Energy Efficiency and Conservation, Renewable Energy, uh, Regional Energy Policy and Planning, and also Civilian Nuclear Energy. So ASEAN has uh, put emphasis on attracting investment specifically in the ASEAN Power Grid and uh, the Regional Energy Policy and Planning Program areas. Although the focus is more on the infrastructure and technologies, but considering the sub theme of APAIC Phase 2 is energy transition, so this um, investment will somehow channel on decarbonization plans also. Perhaps uh, it could be one of the suggestions moving forward also to clearly state investment for clean energy in the next cycle of APAIC because uh, the regional platform will be uh, crucial in attracting further investment in the region. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Rika Safrina, for pointing out the how important the the regional platform, like including the collaboration, uh, to attract the more investment for the region. I mean, to support the energy transition in in the region. So now let me uh, move to the to Ms. Emma from the IEA. Um, we would like to know, like globally, which regulatory device have proof most effective at driving the growth of the sustainable and transition finance? Thank you for the question. So um, what we've seen at the global level is that really um, taxonomies and uh, reporting um, regulations have, have been really key to driving these instruments. So uh, we saw Europe uh, really take the lead um, in pushing for uh, green finance, sustainable finance, um, starting around sort of, as I said, 2014-16 is, is when we saw green bonds start to emerge. Uh, and, and we saw the Euro European countries and the EU um, taking taking the lead there. Um, there are a couple of different elements. Firstly, um, it's useful to have uh, reporting requirements for, uh, for companies and for financial providers. This helps really uh, sensitize the idea that environmental and social data is important, that gathering that information in order to um, create key sort of KPIs in those areas uh, is an important activity. It also highlights that those are risks that can be priced in um, to financial instruments. Um, and that's one of the things that has really dry, um, driven um, green bonds to be cheaper than their uh, vanilla counterparts, those which uh, don't have a, a green affiliation. Um, and then as, as mentioned, when I was talking about the transition finance piece, um, it's also important to have definitions, clear definitions, um, often within country specific or regional taxonomies. Uh, for example, we saw the EU sustainable finance technology, but certainly not the only one. These are uh, now present uh, across multiple regions. Um, and as I think we've, we've had a, a question in the Q&A about the uh, ASEAN green taxonomy for, yeah. for sustainable finance. Um, so mm -hmm. perhaps I, I would pass to Ace to, to speak to that. But these taxonomies um, are, are particularly useful uh, to lay the groundwork, to familiarise not just companies, but also the financial community with which activities can be funded um, and the benefit that that can bring uh, in terms of uh, an overall path to net zero. Thank you, Emma, for your response. Yeah, and also for touching one question in the Q&A about the ASEAN Green uh, Taxonomy. Yeah, I agree with you that reporting regulation is also the key for the successful of the investment in the clean energy transition. And also, uh, as we are aware that the uh, tax, green taxonomy for uh, taxon, ASEAN taxonomy for green finance is quite new. Yeah, it's just newly launched. I think it, it will require some time for the ASEAN uh, region to understand and also how to link with their ongoing project in the region. Okay, thank you so much. And now let me move to uh, Ibu Andrea. Perhaps this is uh, our last <laughs> question and answer session. I understand we, we are interested to know more, but we, we will have another session for the next session. So my last question to uh, Ibu Andrea. Uh, what, what do you think the potential area for collaboration uh, among EMS uh, between ASEAN and also relevant partners that can be strengthened to support the sustainable energy finance in, in ASEAN? I understand your presentation is about Indonesia, but 
we also uh, all aware that Indonesia is one of the key player in the ASEAN region. So would appreciate if you could have your view on this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think um, yeah we can share in uh, experience because uh, every uh, ASEAN country ha has a different uh, step on uh, renewable energy uh, development, such as in Indonesia. Uh, uh, beside for the electricity, we also already uh, already implemented the biofuel with B thirty five. So sharing knowledge, sharing experience between. Uh, uh, EMS is, uh, I think, very useful. Uh, yeah, to to work together in the region, uh, how to increase the implementation of uh, renewable energy capacity building uh, is also, I think, uh, quite uh, uh, important for us uh, because, as I mentioned before, we are in different uh, stage here. Yeah? Uh, and also different technology. So I think capacity building and also uh, access for financing is important uh, for uh, the priority for us for the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ibu uh, Andrea, for your response. Okay, now, yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry, although we, we are still interested to discuss more with the, all the presenters, but uh, I have to end this question and answer for the session one. And now back to you, Cecilia. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Abdullah, for, for moderating session one. And thank you very much to all the participants for submitting your questions first, uh, via the Q&A function. We will try, and I, I invite the, the speakers, um, Ibu Thebi, uh, Rika, and Emma, if you are able to, to continue uh, trying to respond to some of the questions that have been uh, put into the Q&A uh, to uh, reply to uh, questions by writing. Um, but in the interest of time, we'd like to now move on to session two. Um, we have three experts in this session. Uh, uh, to share different country experiences uh, with green, social, sustainable, and sustainability-linked bonds for financing the clean energy transition. Um, if the uh, three uh, speakers could um, turn on their, their videos, I will pose um, questions to each of you, one at a time. Uh, for the first uh, introductory question, you'll each have three minutes to provide a oral response, and then we will try to take up to uh, three rounds of prepared questions before turning over to our participants to submit their uh, questions to you uh, via the Q&A function. Um, so uh, our first uh, uh, discussant is Dr. Uh, Shi Lin. She is a senior researcher at the International Cooperation Department um, at the International Institute of Green Finance in, in China. Um, Dr. Uh, Ninshi, thank you. She, she, thank you very much for joining us uh, today uh, for this session. Um, could you briefly uh, describe recent developments in the use of GSS uh, bonds in China's clean energy transition? Okay, thanks for having me here. I'm Lin from IGF at the Central University of Finance and Economics. So for China, China has experienced a notable increase in the insurance of green uh, social and sustainability bonds, reflecting China's determination to fund clean energy projects. In the first half of this year, 2023, China's green bond market exhibits significant growth and commitment to sustainable finance, a total of uh, around 20, 221 green bonds, both domestically and internationally, were issued during this period, amounting to around 470 billion yuan. Domestically, uh, there were 207 new green bonds issued, uh, total, totaling around 450 billion yuan. 
the total outstanding volume of green bond in China as of the first half of 2023 reached around 3.3 trillion yuan, highlighting China's proactive use of green bonds to finance environmentally responsible projects and drive sustainable development. So regarding the sectors, uh, the back, the green bonds have constantly prioritized the fields like the uh, clean energy sector and the enhancement of uh, environmentally sustainable inf infrastructure with clean energy industries receiving uh, around 30% of the funding allocation uh, and infrastructure green upgrades in receiving around 17% in 2023, 2022. Furthermore, the scope of specialized green bond categories is continuous, uh, is uh, expanding. So in China, we, in, since starting from 2022, there are many kinds of scope uh, categories of, uh, bond, of GSS bonds, such as the carbon neutral bonds. Uh, in China, reached like uh, nearly 200 billion yuan in 2022. Uh, and also the blue bonds. In 2022, the new issuance volume of blue bonds accounted to 11.5 billion yuan, making up of 83% of the total. In particular, in response to the economic development demands for transitioning high carbon industries, uh, innovative bonds like low carbon transition bonds, transition bonds, and the transition linked bonds were introduced in 20, last year to broaden the financing avenue available for low carbon transformation initiatives. Uh, in last year, China witnessed a total of 10 issuance of transition bonds accounting to uh, a cumulative volume of uh, around 50 billion yuan. Concerning the allocation of raised funds, these transition bonds were, uh, were for the projects associated with industrial low carbon transformation and uh, clean coal. Furthermore, in 2022, China also issued low carbon transition corporate bond and also more also the sustainability linked bonds is also an innovative type of bond introduced in China's bond market. In 2022, China issued uh, 33 uh, yes 33 domestic issuance of sustainability linked bond uh, accumulative uh, they are uh, reaching a volume of uh, 389 billion yuan. In the first half of 2022, China issued 12 new sustainability linked bonds with a total size of around 16, 16 billion yuan. These bonds uh, predominantly revolved around the matrix of clean energy installed capacity. Uh, certain also certain enterprise uh, also uh, incorporates key performance indicators uh, such as the uh, completed green building area, comprehensive energy consumption per unit of steel per unit product energy consumption within the chemical industry sector, um, and the rate of methane uh, extraction and utilization. So. In with also the social responsibility bonds also very new to China. So it was in promoted by the National Association of Financial Market Institution, no investor in 2021. So in last year, we have uh, two social responsibility bonds issued. Uh, and but uh, this year, we don't have any social responsibility bond right now. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's the current situation of GSS bond in China. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Xu, for this comprehensive overview. So now our second discussion uh, for this session is uh, Councillor uh, Feng Sufal, um, Senior Financial Sector Specialist 
at the Asian Development Bank. And apologies for, for my pronunciation of your name. Um, could you kindly uh, provide us a brief description of how the ASEAN Catalytic Green Fund and ADB more broadly has been supporting green bond issuances in ASEAN? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, first of all, thank you very much um, for, for the invitations. And uh, for ADB, we have been, um, you know, working very closely, um, you know, with many of the ASEAN governments, um, as well as um, sustainable bond issuers. I would say GSS plus bond issuers, um, you know, across the region um, through both the ASEAN Catalytic Green Finance Facility or the ACGF. Um, you know, and we also have um, the ASEAN Plus Three, um, you know, Asian Bond Markets Initiative, um, you know, that providing, um, you know, similar support um, to issuers. So the ACGF focuses, you know, on um, sovereign, sub-sovereign, as well as, um, you know, SOE issuers, while the, um, the ASEAN Plus Three program is focusing more on the corporate issuers. So, um, you know, when we speak to, to external parties, um, we often say that, um, you know, ADP as an entity, so we can, um, you know, we have other resources um, to support all kind of, um, you know, issuers who would like to issue sustainable bonds. And I um, mean, you know, back to your questions, um, you know, what kind of support, um, you know, can 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 we provide? Um, so I, I think we need to accept the fact that, um, you know, in ASEAN, um, you know, many, you know, different countries, you know, have different levels of, of, you know, capital market development. Maybe we have, um, you know, more developed. Um, you know, countries like Singapore, all the way down to countries even without a bond market, right? So, so our support has to be, um, you know, customized, um, you know, to 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 each countries. So, what we can do is, uh, we actually provide, um, you know, hand-on support, um, to potential issuers. Um, this means that, um, you know, all the way from project selection, um, you know, bond framework development. Um, to make sure that the framework itself um, aligns with international and regional standards. Um, just um, in case some of the audience doesn't know, um, you know, in ASEAN, we have our own ASEAN Green Social Sustainability as well as SLB bond standards um, developed by the ASEAN Capital Markets Forum. And um, the ASEAN standards actually aligns with the ICMA principles. So all the transactions that we supported, um, you know, are aligned with all these, um, you know, international and regional standards. So um, I think last, um, you know, since 2020, um, we supported, um, you know, more than 10 issuers um, already. So we catalyzed the issuance. Um, I, I use the word catalyze very carefully because, um, you know, we help, you know, only the first time issuer, right? So we catalyzed, um, you know, more than, um, you know, 2 billion US dollars um, equivalent um, in local currencies, um, you know, for the past um, two or three years. And later on, um, you know, many of those issuers, um, you know, were um, able to issue um, sustainable bonds by themselves, right? So, so we helped with the first issuance and later on they issued the bonds by themselves altogether around 12 billion US dollars. So I think, um, you know, the, the role of development banks um, like ADB is, is very important because, um, you know, we have been talking to many of the issuers and, um, you know, they, they are keen to issue this kind of bonds, right? But they don't know where to start. They don't know what to do. And especially, um, you know, in markets, um, you know, where there's a very early stage of development, like Cambodia, for example, um, we also providing hand-holding support, hand-on support to the underwriters themselves as well, um, you know, in addition to, um, you know, any, um, you know, capacity building activities. So this is what we do um, in ADB and um, our, happy to, to share more um you know during our discussion today back to you thank you thank you very much for taking us through um uh, the support uh, provided by adb and it's, it's fantastic to see that it is very much targeted to the the situation in each country and to the type of issuer um so we'll, we'll be coming back to, to some of those elements so our our final um expert for for this session is marty sakia who is deputy chief financial officer at ascent corporation um, could you please describe the key drivers for ASEAN's green bond issuances and what lessons can be shared with other firms considering issuing GSSB uh, bonds to raise capital for investments in energy transition? Yeah. Hi, Cecilia. Th thanks so much uh, for inviting us to, to speak today. And um, uh, hello to all our, our listeners and uh, audience today. Maybe what would help is to give a bit of a background on who ASEN is. So ASEN is a member of the Ayala Group. It's one of the larger conglomerates here in the Philippines. Um, we are a fairly new company. We 
were only established in 2011, and we started very small um, in, in the power industry in 2011 with a 78 megawatt investment in um, power, of which only 17 megawatts was a renewable energy um, capacity. You know? So we're listed in the Philippines and we're very privileged um, because of the nature of our business to have uh, GIC of Singapore as a shareholder in ASEM. Um, over over this past 10 years, we've gr grown tremendously and we we now have a presence in Philippines, Australia, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, Laos, and uh, even in the US, um, which makes um, our access to the capital markets even more important as we expand uh, around the region and even globally. Uh, we have a very ambitious goal of building 20 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity by 2030. Currently, we have 4.5 gigawatts of operating uh, capacity and capacity under construction. So with that, no, we, we have about uh, 4.5 times to grow in terms of capacity over the next seven years. And along with that, our balance sheet also has to grow 4.5 times. And, you know, GSSB fundraising has been a key instrument and part of our funding strategy um, in the past uh, three, four years. And it will be a very key um, part of our funding strategy going forward. So your first question was on the key drivers um, for ASEN to, to tap uh, green bond issuances. No? So between 2019 and 2022, that's when we made this pivot towards renewable energy. And the amount of capital that we needed to raise was quite high. And, you know, we had an ambition of growing five to five gigawatts by 2025, which we know we're going to surpass by now. And as I mentioned, no, we're looking at 20 gigawatts uh, by 2030. So by, by putting the green bond um, label and um, standards into our issuances, we were able to differentiate our offerings and attract um, a broader set of investors, including um, ESG investors. We wanted to, to make our name more um, interesting for, for a different type of investor base. And at that time, there were not many uh, green bond issuers um, in 2019 when we first came to market. And as uh, Mr. Kosinter mentioned, you know, that, um, you know, ADB and other multilaterals had interest in helping develop that market and for issuers that are in renewable energy. So ADB um, is actually one of our key investors in our first uh, issuance. Um, we, secondly, one of the other drivers is, you know, it was an opportunity to introduce ASEN um, to the international investors. Uh, given the size of our needs, it was very important for us to establish access beyond local banks and the local investor base. Um, so we really wanted to get um, our, our, our name known in the international debt capital markets. Uh, thirdly, you know, because our, our business pivoted towards renewable energy, it was a definite fit with the green bond um, and a GSSB uh, type of framework. So our, our renewable energy business is in line with the use of proceeds and the requirements of the ASEAN green bond standards. Um, so it may, actually it makes it easier for us to, to repeatedly tap the market because that's the nature of our business. So at the moment, uh, part of our vision includes um, shifting our, our capacity to 100% renewable by 2025. Um, we actually completed an energy transition mechanism financing in 2000, uh, just last year. We completed it in November. So um, our thermal capacity has dropped down to 2%. So we're very close to our goal of 100% renewable um, in the next two years. Um, fourthly, in terms of drivers, um, you know, our engagement with the SPO or second, secondary party opinion provider, uh, which is Sustainalytics for our green bond frameworks, uh, which is aligned with the 
uh, International Capital Market Association uh, green bond principles um, really provided additional credibility to our, our issuances. And aside from that, by, by creating the first um, GSSB issuance for ASIN, we were able to create a framework for um, uh, succeeding issuances by our, our company. You know? So we actually raised about 1.57 billion across five issuances in the dollar market um, between 2019 to 2021. In fact, um, three of those deals were uh, fixed for life instruments, meaning the the coupon, uh, the, the transactions are perpetual bond issuance with a very low coupon um, with a call option on our side. So the, the green bond uh, flavor actually allowed us to, to be able to lock in those uh, very interesting and very uh, uh, diverse type of uh, instrument. So I don't think this fix for life instrument will be accessible in the very near future. The coupons we got on those perpetual instruments are less than or about five percent and, and below, so it's really good financing for for a renewable energy company. So as I mentioned, by by setting up the first GSSB framework in the dollar market, it also allowed us to tap the Philippine market. Um, last year, we did a, our first Philippine bond issuance um, for ten billion pesos. Um, we're also looking at. Um, we, we actually also completed some green loans um, based on the frameworks of um, the GS, GSSB you know, and which we, we aligned with, with, with those standards. And maybe it's also worth mentioning that we, we are in the middle of discussions for a sustainability linked loan, although not yet in the bond market, but at the moment we're looking at the loan uh, market. So in terms of lessons that from our end, maybe just to, to recap quickly, right? Um, it's important that, you know, you align the green bond issuance, issuances with the use of proceeds and the, the project evaluation and selection with the company's own sustainability goals and objectives. ASEN, it's easier for us because of the, the nature of our RE um, focus now. And there is a need to comply with the CN green bond standards and other relevant guidelines and regulations. Um, thirdly, we, we believe there is real value in engaging third party experts to provide the opinions on the alignment of the green bond issuance with international standards and best practice. Um, uh, fourthly, we learned that um, you know, there is significance in being transparent in our monitoring and reporting of, of our commitments in building, um, you know, investor confidence and trust in, in our, our company. And lastly, uh, there is a benefit of incorporating flexibility in the green, social, sustainable framework that we use. So, as, as I mentioned, you know, the, the lessons we learned from the green bond issuance we're applying now to um, our loan um, and other types of financing that we do. Uh, that's it for me, Cecilia. Thank you. Thanks very much, Marty. Very impressive um, experience that we've seen with us in, in, in that very uh, rapid uh, rollout of renewables and the access, the positive access you've seen in terms of raising uh, private capital for financing the transition with what what you know appears to be you know a very attractive terms, you, you did highlight that in the near term, given the current market conditions, it's, it's unlikely that we'd see some of that replicating, but perhaps as as markets um, stabilize uh, and interest rates come down, um, hopefully we'll be able to to come back uh, for the region with, with these uh, more attractive uh, conditions. Um, so uh, we're going to now go on to some, some additional uh, questions and I, I'd uh, remind uh, or ask the discussants to try to be uh, a bit brief so that we can also have time to turn to the uh, floor. But I think it was important to have that those very comprehensive um, introductory overviews to really situate um, the different country experiences as well as as the experience and, and role that your different institutions have have played. Um, 
Dr. Shi, could you tell us a little bit about the incentives or support that China has provided for, for issuers and the role this has played in really helping to, to establish and grow the marketplace? Thank you. Thanks for your question. So uh, China actually has introduced the various uh, incentives and the support mechanism to encourage issuers and the financial institutions in the field of green finance. So at the national level, China follows the top-down fashion as usual and has introduced the top-level designs and the strategic guidelines, such as the action plan for carbon picking before 2030, uh, to strategically set the tone for green finance development. Uh, these designs promote product innovation, international cooperation, and the comprehensive development of green finance. Uh, also, but as a at the local level, financial reforms have been implemented and innovation pilot zones have been established and various regions are accelerating the establishment of local green bond system along with uh, the development of corresponding incentive uh, mechanism. Uh, these incentive mechanisms involve providing uh, involves uh, many many ways, such as like providing a floating interest rate subsidy, ranging from one percent to ten percent, uh, based on factors such as the issuer's credit rating and the size of the bond issuance. In addition, uh, issuance costs uh, are reduced. Furthermore, we still have we provide like cash incentives ranging from tens of thousands to millions of yuan, uh, uh, to, to based on the performance of indicators related to the green bond insurance market and the types of bonds issued. Uh, for example, like China has introduced several pilot zones at the local level to support the development of GSS bond. Mm, these zones have introduced local regulations to promote green finance support, carbon neutrality, uh, also encourage biodiversity financing and establish green finance corridors. Uh, for example, uh, Chongqing is a city in the Southwest China. So designed uh, as a green finance palace zone aiming to establish the Yangtze River green finance corridor. And uh, Huzhou is also in the South East China, so released the guidelines for biodiversity financing, focusing on uh, the innovative tools and the conservation targets. Uh, also in, I think last year in uh, September, uh, in Beijing launched an action plan to accelerate the development of global green finance and the sustainable financial center. Uh, also, also like us, we are the research center. So we are many like research center like us in China right now to uh, assist the design of the strategic plan for financial, uh, for, for the local financial like implementation plan. Yeah, that's, so I think that's the experience from the China, so. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Dr. Xi, and uh, great to see all of the different um, regional and city level initiatives that China is implementing and, and really that comprehensive approach and also um, looking at, at how to create the right, right ecosystem. Um, so uh, now, um, uh, Kacinta, you, you had already mentioned in your introductory remarks some of the incentives and support that ADB provides, but um, could you perhaps go a little bit deeper to highlight um, uh, any additional incentives or support that, that, that ADB has that you haven't yet mentioned? And also perhaps just connect that with how this has really helped to create or establish um, a GSSB bonds in uh, the region or in a given country. Sure, sure. Um, actually, um, I have you know briefly um, explain about what we do, how we work with the companies, uh, you know, with um, you know issuers. But also let, let, let me share with you some of the um, the case studies, um, the transactions um, that, that that we did. So for, for ADB, uh, we actually provide technical assistance um, you know, to, to support issuances of um, sustainable bonds, right? And so in that case, um, you know, we, we also understand the market environment, the challenges um, that issuers, um, underwriters, as well as investors often face. So um, you know, as uh, we use the word honest broker, 
right? So, so we also convey those kind of messages, you know, back to the regulators. So, so we also, um, you know, support like three, um, you know, developments as well. For example, um, I, I saw uh, there are many um, you know, Indonesian um, stakeholders um, in, in the webinar. So um, let me use Indonesia as a case study uh, because, you know, Indonesia um, previously, the, the OJK or the Financial Services Authority uh, only have the green bond regulation um, for, for green bond issuance in Indonesia. So in the past, um, you know, issuing other kind of sustainable bonds like social bonds, sustainability bonds was not possible, right? Only until um, yesterday, uh, you know, when, when the social bond uh, and, and, you know, sustainability bonds as well as sustainability link bonds um, were issued um, by, by, by the regulator. So we also, um, you know, work very closely with the regulator, um, you know, to 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 advise them on how the regulations could be developed, um, you know, what um, you know approaches have been taken, um, you know, by other countries, so that um, the um, you know regulations can be on par with international standards and practices. And also, um, you know, as a development bank, um, you know, ADB, we also act as an anchor, um, you know, investors. Right, so uh, many of the um, you know, issuers, um, you know, decided to issue sustainable bonds because they want to broaden their investor base. So, um, ADB, we also have our private sector operation department, um, you know, that um, do investments. Um, so normally we invest um, about thirty or forty percent of the total deal size, so that the remaining can be invested by the local investors. So this is also a way um, for for our developing member countries to develop their uh, you know, domestic capital uh, markets, and also you know to become more familiar with investments in sustainable bonds. And also, we offer um, I would say you know more innovative um, you know solutions. Uh, we provide concessional finance um, you know from our partners and also donors um, to make sure that um, the projects um, in in this case it could be the sovereign projects or the um, projects at the municipal level. Uh, become more bankable, right? So we provide the risking support so that the projects become more bankable and that they can attract financing, um, you know, from the private sector. Um, you know, we all know that, um, you know, ASEAN um, or any other developing member countries, um, you know, requires um, significant, um, you know, finance um, to support the transition strategy. And relying on, you know, government budget alone is not enough, right? We need to mobilize the private sector funding. So this kind of you know de-risking facility actually helps to to attract the private capital um, to support their strategy, and uh, we also um, you know offer advice. Um, so for example, um, um, just um, you know in July this year, um, you know ADB we support the first ever gender bond um, you know in the Philippines um, by the ASA Philippines Foundation, and also just um, last week we supported the first um, you know sustainability link bonds um, in Thailand issued under the ASEAN sustainability link bond standards. So, so we also try to um, you know, offer um, you know, innovative um, solutions um, to, to the companies that we work with. And um, what I forgot to say is that you know, these services are free of charge, right? So we don't charge any fees um, from, from, from companies. And um, also I would like to um, you know, take this opportunity to reiterate um, you know, what, what Marty just you know, mentioned in his um, remarks that um, we, we are also seeing, you know, companies uh, are moving towards, you know, sustainability linked bonds or loans um, issuance because, um, you know, based on our discussion, um, you know, with many of the institutional, um, you know, investors, what investors are looking for is actually the sustainability strategy of the company as a whole, not, not project by project anymore. Right. So they want to know how companies perform. They want to know how the governance, how the strategy, how the risks are, being managed, right? So, so I think this is the trend where 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 we are um you know, starting um to go. So maybe um I, I'll stop here and also I can expand more um later during the Q and A. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um for providing those additional insights and and particularly sharing those important case studies with with the participants. Um, it's it's a, you know important to have um you know actors like ADB. That are able to provide, you know, critical capacity support and also uh, play the role of, of anchor investors to mobilize much more private uh, investments. Um, uh, Marty, now I'd like to ask you: Could you say a few words about the role that different government policy or incentives played in ASEAN's uh, ASEAN's green bond issuances? Right. Um, 
Yeah, in terms of the green bond issuances, I think the most influence and uh, support came from the Philippine uh, Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, you know, they in 2018 they adopted the ASEAN green bond standards, um, which really underscored how the government could support green financing, and you know this provided the foundation of our own uh, green bonds. You know, the circular it provided guidance on the issuance of green bonds and requires issuers to comply with the ASEAN green bond standards, including, you know, guidelines on the use of proceeds, how we select our projects, how we evaluate um, and manage the proceeds of, you know, from, from the fundraisings. And of course, there's the regular reporting of um, how, how the proceeds are being used. Um, the standards also require us to uh, disclose other information, uh, such as, as I mentioned, uh, the, how, how we selected the project and uh, where, where the proceeds are. Um, again, you know, investors would also look towards the SEC's own guidelines to, to evaluate ASEN's own framework and, and to, you know, by, by comparing both, they're able to get comfort that ASEN's own framework is um, you know, credible and uh, a meaningful um, GSSB application. Right? Um, there, there's also in two, in April this year, right? Uh, the Philippine SEC also issued guidelines on the issuance of sustainability linked bonds um, under the ASEAN sustainability linked bond standards. Although we haven't seen an issuance yet, I think um, probably there are other issuers already um, looking at this approach. Um, I, on the loan side, no, maybe not just the bond side, I, it's worth commenting that even the central bank is supporting renewable energy and um, they're giving certain uh, leeway to, to banks to, to lend towards um, um, RE projects. So they're increasing this, there's talk of increasing of the single borrower limit as well as um, suspension of reserve requirements once the banks lend to to renewable energy. So this could also help uh, the bank's own treasury in their investment in uh, GSSB uh, bonds. So I, I think I'll stop there. There are other government initiatives, but they're all um, very supportive, but not particularly on GSSB. Thank you very much, Marty, for, for taking us through you know, the role of, of different government um, regulation and, and policies to support uh, the market development. Um, now, this is our, our, our last round of prepared questions, and I'd like to invite participants to submit any questions that you may have for our three discussants uh, via the, the Zoom Q&A. Please do indicate um, who your question is, is targeted to. Um, now, uh, Dr. Shi, uh, could you um, highlight any major barriers that was faced in China for the early issuers? Uh, of GSSB um, uh, in the energy sector and how these were overcome? Yes, uh, actually the for the the guideline for building the green finance system in China has uh, introduced in 2016. So along all these years, we had many difficulties. difficulties. Uh, first, I think the most important at the start is the major barrier was the absence of standardized guidelines and the reporting frameworks for green and sustainable bonds. So this made it difficult for issuers to communicate the environmental and the social impact of their project effectively. Uh, also for investors, uh, they were hesitant about the, the perceived risks associated with green energy projects particularly concerning the reliability and the profitability of the renewable energy uh, ven revenues and ventures. And also uh, one barrier is also, uh, I think it's the uh, accurate data on the environmental and the social impact of the projects. It's, of, it's often lacking or not easily accessible. Still, it's still an issue right now, making it challenging for issuers to provide transparent and credible information to investors. And one issue, uh, as I introduced before, so we have many pilot uh, 
like already cities zones already but the problem is that they all like located in the uh, rather developed regions in China. So we still have a vast areas of the central and the western regions, which are still in the developing issues and the rural areas. So these regions face a significant gap between green finance policy and the market practice. So resulting from uh, this, well, result, I think it's resulting from inadequate policy transmission and the limited market conditions. So this gap led to differences in assessing uh, green finance market effectiveness and the policy evaluation. Well, this is still the issue. So I think the government is still working on it. I hope we can see more like pilot zone in those rural areas. So also there's uh, one thing, uh, one barrier is like, uh, is the insufficient policy coordination. So achieving carbon neutrality goals requires um, coordination among various government departments. Uh, like including like the financing, housing, ecology, and environment. So regulatory policies and the green industries and uh, fiscal uh, policies needed harmonization and coordination to ensure the policy coherence. Uh, also, uh, also it's one thing is about the coordination between standards. So the existing green finance standards focused on like pure green sectors, like energy conservation, environmental protection, and the green construction and the infrastructure. So there was a lack of effective coordination with the transition goals of high carbon industries. So including how can we like, including the criteria uh, for assessing environmental benefits, carbon emissions, and information disclosure. So, oh yes, yeah, among all those uh, barriers, so some of them has been addressed through efforts to enhance like policy market alignments. Uh, we also we can see like new policies has been issued uh, recent last year, especially since last year. So improved. Also, we have like improved the policy coordination, and and we can we can see as I introduced, we have like introduced the very diverse uh, financial products uh, covering the bond and the sustainability transition bond and so less etc. So also we aligned uh, also mining, um, we also in introduced some green like standards with industrial carbon neutrality paths. So yep, so there are still many issues uh, around us. So I think they are still are uh, ready to like to resolve many of them. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shi, for, for sharing uh, for with us some of China's experiences and, and those challenges and how those were overcome through policy and, and regulation. And you know, as you you sort of provided, the market um, globally has evolved substantially from you know the early days of green finance and green finance regulation to recognize the need to support broader transitions and also provide um, regulation and frameworks that can also support uh, carbon intensive industries in their, their transition. Um, now, uh, uh, Kacinta, um, could you uh, talk a little bit more about ADSB's experience in terms of um, some of the key barriers you've seen working with your partners in, in ASEAN and uh, what solutions um, uh, you've implemented to help overcome some of these challenges? Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, I, actually, um, you know, at least in, in my personal point of view, there are quite a number of challenges, um, and you know, solutions to these challenges, you know, may take time. Right? So, um, you know, as I said, um, you know, in ASEAN, um, you know, we we have um, you know, different level of capital market developments, right? So, um, you know, in in countries with um, you know, early stage of market development like Cambodia. Um, the um, the technical capacity of the the local stakeholders is maybe limited. You know, if you compare this to Thailand or the Philippines or, or Singapore, right? And also the lack of um, you know sufficient domestic institutional investor base, um, you know, is is also still an issue um, in many of the developing um, you know member countries. So um, I think it's just a matter of um, you know trying to. Um, you know, get um, you know companies um, you know with um, you know the, um, you know credible um, you know, transition plans, or those you know with good credit ratings um, you know to come to the market. Um, especially 
um, the most um, you know trustworthy um, type of issuers. Um, in this case, I, I meant the financial institutions, right? Because um, you know they are well supervised, um, you know, by the central banks, and they are in a good position to to mobilize um, you know funds you know, from capital market. Um, to to support um, you know many of the um, you know, domestic green projects and even to support the SMEs um, to 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 become greener and many of you may know the um, the cross border carbon adjustment mechanisms um, is um, to be implemented um, you know in the very near future so the SMEs will be highly impacted so I think that the role of uh, financial institutions and giving them I mean and and you know having them to understand about um, you know how they can play the role to support the market development and also to support the local um, companies. I think this is also very um, important. And um, you know, in ASEAN, we also have the the ASEAN Sustainable Finance Taxonomy. Um, as as um, you know, you may know this is um, among the first taxonomy that um, have that follows the traffic light systems, right? So unlike the EU taxonomy that is binary, you know, which is green or not green, right? So in the ASEAN taxonomy, um, there is a transition um, pathways, right? So we have the, the, the green, the amber, and also the red. Uh, so we, we follow traffic light systems. So um, one of the key challenges is how to make sure that those um, you know, in the amber category um, can actually move to green, right? Because you know, catalyzing, um, you know, I mean, sorry, categorizing um, their business activities as amber doesn't really mean anything un unless we provide some guidance for them um, on how they can transition their operations um, to, to green. So this is also something that is um, you know, very um, you know, important for ASEAN. And yesterday, I think the, the ASEAN um, transition guidelines um, you know, was published for consultations. So if any of you have any inputs, I mean, this would be very useful uh, for, for the region. And also, um, the implementation of the international sustainability um, standards um, in, in, in June, um, you know, is also another big step uh, for many of the ASEAN companies um, as well, or the ISSB standards. Um, previously, the TCFD or the, um, um, the recommendations uh, was, you know, only voluntary, right? But the ISSB standards, um, can be made mandatory by the local capital market regulators. So, um, you know, adopting these standards, um, you know, by local listed companies, um, you know, could be a big task um, for them. So, a lot of you know capacity building um, support, um, you know, for for ASEAN companies, um, you know, even for um, you know bigger companies uh, will be very um, important as well. And um, lastly, I think I would like to highlight the importance of data comparability, right? Uh, because um, for for many companies, um, you know they are they are um, you know issuing bonds or loans, you know tapping the institutional investors. But going forward, investors would want to know um, the environmental performance of company A and company B, right? How 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 they compare. So having um, a credible um, you know data and comparable data will be extremely um, you know important um, for 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 those companies and also for for investors as well. And, but of course, you know, this doesn't really mean anything unless we have a standardized, um, you know, disclosure, um, you know, requirements um, across the region, which to me, ISB is very um, important. Um, you know, lastly to say, um, I think this accessible finance topic is a very big topic, right? And, and no one, you know, can cover all the issues, not IEA, not ADB or the IFC or other partners can cover all the issues. So. Um, I would say the collaboration among international development partners is extremely um, important. Um, you know, we have been working very closely with the UNDESCAP, UNDP, GTGI, and others, um, you know, for our programs, you know, in ASEAN. And this um, actually um, turned out to be very effective, um, you know, in, in, in my point of view. And we all stop here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much for, for highlighting, you know, quite a number of, of elements, including the role of, of international collaboration, and, and we're very pleased to be able to convene um, experts in, in forums such as this to, to really share country experience, and, uh, but also um, in also highlighting the role that data plays in, in all of this work and really providing uh, investor confidence. It's, it's really critical that we have good, comparable, reliable data to support uh, investment decisions, as well as the, the important role that different um, taxonomies, regulation and frameworks have played in, in really driving and, and, and building a, a robust uh, uh, market. 
Um, so a uh, final question that, that I have for, for our discussants and just a final reminder, if any participants do have questions to our, our group of experts here, please do enter these into the, the Q&A um, and indicate who, who your question is, is targeted towards. So Marty, earlier this year, and you, you mentioned this, I believe in your introduction, um, there was uh, a domestic issuance of uh, 10 billion uh, Philippine pesos. I believe that was more than eight times oversubscribed. Uh, could you um, describe for us who are the main sources of demand for this bond? And uh, do you have any insights as to the reasons um, for for such high demand? Um, and uh, could you indicate how much of that issuance uh, went to financing new renewable energy projects and how much was used for, for refinancing? And then finally, um, is there any plans for ASIN to go back to the market uh, this year or, or next year for another tranche of that pre-approved, um, I think it was uh, 30 billion in uh, Philippine peso issuances. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, Cecilia, thanks uh, for the multiple questions. Um, I'll try to answer succinctly. Um, you know, we, in, in, as I mentioned, right, the peso bond issue in September 2022 was our very first. So I think that drove a lot of uh, interest from investors because of the scarcity or rarity of the, the issuance. And I think invest, Philippine investors at that time are already very familiar with ASEAN because of our dollar issuances. So it was their opportunity to invest in a local currency bond from a name that they already understood and that had very clear um, GSSB and green standard um, uh, framework. So, um, we think that the SEN green bond labeling for our, our, our peso bond um, drove investor interest. Uh, year on year, we're seeing more and more local investors getting um, more aware of the ESG um, type of investment, um, even at the retail level. In terms of the investors that that bought into our, our deal, no? um, you know, ma majority of that eight, 86 billion, the 8.6 times subscription that we saw uh, of orders were, were really mostly from retail clients. The Philippine investor base for, for peso bonds is really driven by retail. And we structured our deal so that it would attract um, that type of investor. And, uh, about one sixth of the orders were from institutional. So it's a very small amount that goes to institutional investors. Retail investors, I suppose, were looking at um, the high yield at that time, uh, given that rates were moving up. Um, they're very yield oriented and they buy and hold their, their, their orders. So it's really the ESG angle plus the rarity of the bond plus just, you know, market interest in the type of coupon that uh, we were printing at that time. Um, again, the engagement of uh, Sustainalytics for our se second party opinion really also helped us. It proved the alignment of our standards to the ICMA green bond principles. And again, we, we also note that we got a AAA rating uh, for the bond issue. So it really helped retail investors um, get more comfort in the in the issue and so on. So the net to answer your other question, the net proceeds from the deal all went to new projects, which is also why it's really attractive to investors. They they know that the money they're they're investing with us is going purely into um, new solar solar project capacity. We, we devoted funds to about 460 megawatts of new capacity. Um, in terms of your last question, like your last question on whether we'll use the shelf next year, um, no, no plans at the moment. Um, we have large funding requirements, and you know that that option is always there. But at the moment, we're looking at other um, sources for next year. That's it for me, Cecilia. Thank you very much, Marty, and and we have um, uh, two questions that have come from Priya Kumari that have been submitted into the, the Q&A. And uh, perhaps um, I will target the first one. 
to Kucinture. Um, what are the regulatory and policy landscapes for sustainable financing in ASEAN countries that the organizations operate in? Oh, I think um, that 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 quite a tough questions. Um, so um, you know, as as I said, you know, ADB we are working very closely, um, you know, with the asset regulators and also with the local investors and potential issuers. So um, my, my, my view is that, um, you know, many of the governments as well as um, issuers, are, um, you know, are very keen on looking at sustainable finance. Um, I think one, one thing that um, I can share is that, um, you know, since the introduction of the ASEAN Green Bond Standards in 2017, by the ACMF, um, as well as the ASEAN Social and Sustainability Bond Standard in 2018, uh, we, we saw a significant increase um, you know, in the issuance of the ASEAN label sustainable bonds since then. So I, I would say um, you know, clear regulatory guidance um, you know, from government um, you know, is, is extremely important. And um, as of now, uh, we already have um, you know, more than um, you know, 40 billion um, dollars local currency equivalents, um, you know, issued under the ASEAN standards already, right? So, so this comes from, um, you know, across the ASEAN region, um, the Philippines, ASEAN, of course, one of them, <laughs> and also Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, even Cambodia. Uh, we have the first green bond issue in Cambodia. So, um, and this 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 trend is um coming, but as I said, um, you know, many of the um, you know, investors are not really looking at the project by project anymore, right? They, they want to have better understandings about the corporate um, sustainability strategy um, as a whole. That's why I, I would say um, the, the sustainability linked bonds um, alone, um, you know, would, would certainly, um, you know, have a role to play. And also many of the, um, you know, regulators are also um, looking at, um, you know, promoting transition finance um, within the, the ASEAN region. The, the ASEAN transition guidelines, um, you know, was endorsed, um, you know, yesterday by by the ASEAN Capital Markets Forum by the ACMF. So I uh, think this is um, sort of you know a, a way to go uh, for for our region. So I, I I can say that you know this is a top priorities um, of, of many of the um, ASEAN governments. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so my last two questions will be for for Marty. Um, uh, how can the organization ensure that its financing strategies are aligned with environmental, social, and governance principles is the, the first one. And then the, the second question, and these are in the written in the, the Q&A, how is the coupon pricing for uh, peso GSS bonds? Um, is that attractive or just almost similar with uh, plain vanilla bonds? Um, and then the other questions are for uh, about Indonesia. So I'm not sure if you, you're gonna wanna take those, but in Indonesia, most green bonds in, in Rupia are issued by, by banks since they, rel since they relatively have lots of potential pipelines, while the IPP power companies here has relatively limited pipelines, thus having too much cash from bonds are deemed less necessary, pricing also less competitive compared to just general bonds. So I think that was uh, some views of how the Philippines and, and Indonesia uh, green bond markets and bond markets uh, differ. Uh, Marty, over to you. Yeah, hi. Um, let me answer the question first on the Philippine uh, coupon pricing. I'm not an authority on Indonesia, so let me tell your experience on the coupon pricing for the peso GSS bond. I mean, there, there's a lot of um, uh, debate about the greenium, right? Whether or not the there's an effect on pricing for for having uh, using a green bond framework or green bond standards for your bond issuance. Um, I think there are too, too many factors played at the time for a peso issuance. Um, rates were moving up quickly. We had set the coupon on a fixed rate basis. So the yields actually compressed. Um, I, I, if my memory is correct, we only, we only pay this uh, premium of 35 basis points over the the government yield. And in fact, the following day, the Philippine government issued the same 10 or five years higher than we did. So the, the, the factors there were, um, you know, there, there's broad interest for the ASEN name. There were a lot of people getting interested in, interested in our story. 
and we had the green the the green bond angle, but also rates were moving quickly um, upward, and we had already set the the ceiling. So I think it's it's hard to decipher which part really is attributable to to the, the having that framework. But I think overall, right, whether it's the dollar or the peso market, having the framework we know broadens the number of investors that come in. Um, and, you know, we, you can work with your syndicate to, to how do you say, um, divert the, the proceeds towards the new investors that you want to, to um, welcome as, as, as your new, as your investor for your future deals, right? Especially ESG investors. Um, on the first question on the financing strategy, I think it's very important from the start to already try to understand the principles and the framework for for ESG and GSSB issuance, and from there um, make sure that you know the whole organization is aligned towards that type of um, financing and the standards being pushed by by the the principles, right? And I think. ASEN, as I mentioned at the very, very start, right, where we're fortunate in a sense that our business is naturally all renewables and it makes it easier for us to comply and meet the standards. But I think there's a lot of discipline that was introduced into the organization in terms of um, knowing where to source our supply, of, uh, you know, how we treat and accredit our vendors. Um, to the way we develop the projects to make sure that um, we meet ESG commitments. So I think by by learning the, the principles and the standards first, you're able to cascade this through the organization and make sure that everyone um, is they're going in the correct direction, right? Um, and you comply going forward. So transparency will be important so that you can be a repeat issuer in the ESG market. And that discipline has to be um, instilled into everyone in the organization. Thank you very much, Marty. Um, with that, I'd like to, to end session two and thank uh, all of our uh, discussants for this very rich and informative discussion. Um, I'd like to also thank all of the participants for, for submitting their, their questions. Apologies if we were not able to get to your uh, question. A lot of them were already answered in writing via the, the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of the Zoom. Um, I'd like, now I'd like to uh, invite uh, Ming Tsi uh, from the President's Office of Energy Foundation China to provide the closing for our event today. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Cecilia. Um, hello, everyone. This is Meng Tsi from Energy Foundation China. Uh, actually, uh, my colleague, uh, Ms. Xin Jianan, the chief of staff of Energy Foundation China, was planning to give the closing remarks, but unfortunately, she is on travel and could not access to uh, our webinar at this moment. So I will give this closing on behalf of her and Energy Foundation China. Um, first of all, I would like to thank all the experts in the previous intervention and discussions. They are very informative and fruitful. I've learned a lot from you. Um, and also, I would like to to thank all the participants today. I saw there have been over 100, almost 180 people online. That's remark uh, remarkable. Um, also, I would like to thank IEA and ACE to co-organize this webinar. Um, Rebecca, Cecilia, Rika, for your great work and for the project and the webinar. Um, we are fully aware that at uh, this conjunction, the world is facing multiple global issues, including climate urgency, economic growth, and energy security. Um, so as you mentioned maybe earlier, um, it is needed to reshape a new growth model for the economy. So there is no doubt that the investment needs to facilitate the low carbon transition instead of carbon intensive projects. I have seen questions addressing this, this issue. Uh, in the uh, chat box. So that poses huge financing challenges for the world, especially for developing countries. Um, with the experiences gained in the fast developing sustainable bond markets with the driving forces of dual carbon targets, China still has challenges to overcome, just like uh, Dr. Shirley mentioned earlier. 
Uh, also for the emerging economies and the developing countries, accessing available finance remains a key barrier, especially when you compare the huge needs in investment and the finance actually uh, available now. I think that is why Energy Foundation China has collaborated with IEA on this topic in the very beginning. We aimed to develop the analysis on progress and the challenges in Chinese energy financing and to strengthen the engagement with stakeholders in, in this area, including the experts here today, and to share the lessons learned with um, ASEAN countries developing economies on how to accelerate sustainable energy investment. So under this project, we launched this um, a World Energy Investment Report as one of IEA's flagship reports in China last month, and also developed the uh, commentary on sustainable debt insurance for transition in China introduced uh, by Emma today. Um, so we think based on the research and analysis we have made, it is great to have the important stakeholders in energy and sustainable finance from China ASEAN countries here today to discuss the challenges and experiences in sustainable debt to fund clean energy projects. We have heard a, a lot of comprehensive information and insights on, on this topic. Um, so uh, I say professional grant making charitable organization, Energy Foundation China is fully aware of the uh, importance, the potential and the challenges that China and ASEAN countries have in energy transition. And we have made efforts in facilitating green investment in ASEAN countries through research and the dialogues with our partners, uh, especially ACE. Uh, as Rika introduced today, uh, Energy Foundation China supported ACE to conduct the research on investment and the measures for clean energy and the power sector resilience in ASEAN. Uh, I, I, and I, we think that the two reports they delivered are um, are very great and also providing the policy suggestions. And we also support ACE to develop a, a new report on ASEAN Energy Investments 2024, which will contribute to the flagship report of the ACE, uh, which, which is AEO. And also in this August, uh, Energy Foundation China brought the Chinese enterprises, financial institutions from China to Indonesia to Bali to, uh, to organize a workshop on low carbon investments uh, together with ACE. So uh, based on uh, what, what I mentioned, uh, our work over the longer term, we hope that our work could serve as a platform for policymakers, financial institutions, private and state-owned enterprises across China and ASEAN to communicate and collaborate. The, the bridging role is, is uh, one of our uh, roles and the foundation China is uh, playing. Also dialogues and the research work could provide advices for policymakings and hopefully could further enrich the analysis on China and other countries uh, in future IEA's report. Um, so I think I'll stop here and thank again for participating in the workshop and look forward to working with all of you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.